right, we can just tell that this is going to be a quality video, you know, by the quality. <laughs> so let's get started. I brought you here today to talk about disappointment, and more specifically, things that have disappointed me. I buy a lot of crap, I'm not gonna lie to you. And 99% of this stuff works fine. I don't really do that much to have high standards for these things that I buy, but yet, some of them still manage to disappoint me. First off, we need to talk about who is selling these products. More specifically, what brand am I buying from? Are they reputable or not? Because when you get into things such as Harbor Freight, which is one of the first things I want to discuss, you get a lot of brands that are privately owned and only really apply to that one particular chain of hardware store. In that case, you can expect some very odd and frankly crap items because, I mean, there is no expectation set there. It's just their brand. So on that note, I won't discuss that poor battery charger that fried the battery of my Ford F-350. We're going to leave that one out and just take the loss on that. Instead, we're going to talk about, namely, brands that have a market, brands that have something to prove, something to actually defend, and presumably competition. Let's get started with something small, and we'll work our way up. Bayer Dynamic DT770 Pros. These headphones are often talked about as the gold standard for reference headphones, in that if you look at a picture of someone from a studio, and oh, that's unsnapped, oops, maybe about half the time, no matter what year it was taken from, if it's anywhere after these were released, you're going to see these in most pictures. And the reviews online are typically glowing, with people talking about just how good that these sound, how wide they sound for being closed backs, and how the bass sounds, and all that good stuff. Well, let's spoil the joke before it even gets started. I got these on sale, because I was in the market for a pair of wired headphones, and I've always heard good things, and they just so happened to be on sale at that moment. So I went ahead and made the purchase. And well, here's the box they came in. It's collected a bit of dust, but I've tried to keep it mostly in shape. Although you may notice it's not in shape. It's actually dented. In fact, it doesn't come across well here, but you see that mark up there? You see how the paper is kind of crinkled? This box was crumpled up like this when I got it. And to me, that little bit right there screams wet. Now, you may argue, reasonably, that, oh, well, they were damaged in shipping. These here obviously had to be dented along by USPS or whoever delivered them, but no. They were in a box that actually had the shipping label that pointed to the warehouse these came from, and the outer box was perfectly fine, the box they were shipped in. This box on the inside is dented, and on the other side, you'll notice it's kind of crushed up here and kind of ripped up here. And no, this was like this when I got it. This is how they were received. And it was reflected in these poor things here. Because when I first got these, one headphone sounded awful. It was the left one. And I'm a big advocate for right to repair. I have the iFixit repair manifesto hanging on my wall. So naturally, I took it upon myself. Instead of going through the warranty, shipping this old crappy box back to them and seeing if they can do anything about it, I took them apart and repaired them myself. What I found that was one of the dynamic drivers, specifically in the left ear cup, had been dented in. It was pushed in at some point during shipping or storage or whatever they do to these poor things. And not just that, there was also a hair already on the inside of the driver. Which if you look up reviews about the DT770s on the internet, you'll most likely find people who complain about a weird sound that comes out of these when there's a hair stuck in them. Well, mine came with that hair from the factory. So I took that hair out and very carefully peeled away the membrane from the rest of the driver, and they still just don't sound right. I've tried a pair of these before elsewhere, and they sounded fine, and a lot of people who you've obviously heard on the internet say that they're fine too. But these just sound wrong, and there's no real way that I can convey it to you. They're just somehow, at some point during storage or something along those lines, these were damaged. And it's brutal too, because this is one of the only pairs of wired headphones I have. Eventually, I ended up getting a lightning connector for these AirPods Max, and they served me well for a while as well. But the fact of the matter is, these have their own battery. If you don't have that battery charged up, they do not work, flat out. They will not run off of just power from the headphone jack at all. They just do nothing. Get this poor box out of here. And you know what? That's actually kind of topical because let's get to these. These right here, this is my second pair of these. And let it be known now that I am not a big fan of Apple. I got these during their actually least popular time. This was before they even blew up on TikTok or whatever anybody uses on the internet nowadays. I was in the market for a new pair of Bluetooth headphones and I wanted something that was sturdy and sounded nice. These seemed to check all the boxes. So when I got my first pair, I was skeptical at first, but impressed. They're actually really nice headphones. And they better be. They're $550 whenever you get them off sale. But within about three months of owning them, my first pair died. 
which is why this is my second pair. It was a slow and painful death with the ear sensors inside seeming to become less and less responsive, I'll say, as they began to die. So essentially what would happen is I would put these on, go to listen to my music, and nothing would happen. I'd have to force reset them by holding down these two buttons just to get them to play at all. And eventually even that stopped working. Luckily they were covered by warranty, so I contacted Apple and asked them, hey, uh, can I get a new pair of these please? And they were happy to oblige. So what you're seeing is a new pair of AirPods, but with cushions off my first pair, because they don't send you new cushions. You have to keep yours, and they're $69. So yeah, that was annoying from a $550 product from a really big company, but what about a $2,700 product from a really big company? This poor tortured soul is my 2016 MacBook Pro. And if you know anything about MacBook Pros, you know that that was the worst era for them. Also, this thing likes to get stuck shut, so let's listen to this real carefully. Oh man. Like I was saying, if you're familiar with this era of Mac, then you know these are the ones with the butterfly keyboard. And honestly, I liked it. When I first got this Mac and the butterfly keyboard was fresh out of the box, it was great. The keys felt nice. They were more mechanical feeling than most flat keyboards of this kind. The touch bar was cool. Touch ID was responsive and all. I honestly didn't hate it at all. Of course, you know, no physical escape key, but the thing stayed up even in the BIOS, so it didn't matter that much. The more important issue was something that Apple was too early for, and everyone knows about this. Let's just cut straight to it. There's your I.O., there's your I.O. Now, USB-C is a great thing, and honestly, I'm a big advocate for getting it in just about every device I can, but the USB-C ports on this thing are despicable. Let's get these poor things out of here. Here's a USB-C cable, nothing special about it. If you plug this in, notice how easily it slides in. I'm using no force whatsoever, and it is just... There's nothing there. There is no gripping force whatsoever. If I if I was to blow on this with my can of compressed air... Okay, well, this is out of air. How do I simulate this? Let's get a comb and just, you know, gently tap the cable. Like, very gently tap the cable. Let's just give it a little tappity tap. You may notice it's already starting to come loose. Yeah, the USB-C ports on this thing are abysmal. And no, it's not just my cable. In fact, I can prove it because my consumer brain got another MacBook Pro just a few years ago. Oh, what is that? So if we move this poor thing out of the way and switch it out with this Chonkster, which honestly is just so much better, using the exact same cable, plugging it in. Oh, what's that? A click? Listen, can you hear that? It clicks in. It's brilliant. Let me move the good one out of the way, and we put the bad one back up in here. Try to listen for that same click. Oh yeah, there is none. And that's a really big deal, especially when you're working with a solid state drive that uses USB-C, because if this thing gets moved at all, even touched, barely, it disconnects and everything that you've moved over has to be moved over again, which you wouldn't think is a big deal, but for some reason, this thing never got its rated USB-C speeds, and I think it's personally because of the processor. I would call it a mid-tier MacBook Pro at $2,799 when it was new. This thing right here had a decent looking spec sheet, but it didn't last at all. This one here is an M1 MacBook Pro, and I mean the toppest of the top of the M1s. I got it on sale and I don't regret it, but this poor thing, it barely, and I mean barely, made it through my school years. In fact, this poor thing has been sent to the Apple Service Center twice, and both times they were kind enough to replace the parts in it with no charge to me. That is rare. And I know a lot of people praise this line of MacBook Pro for just how thin it is, but honestly, I find that the cooling for these things is terrible. They throttle doing anything. This thing is dusty, I am so sorry. This poor fella can't handle himself at all. This one, on the other hand, this thing is a brick. It is enormously thick. And let me just show you. Yeah. And I mean proper I.O. on this thing, an actual SID card reader, USB-C, HDMI. On the other side, you have MagSafe, two more ports, and a headphone jack. Now, let's talk for one more second about the USB-C ports. If you recall, I mentioned just how early Apple was to the USB-C hype train, and that meant you needed one of these. This here is a USB-C to everything adapter. Well, just about everything, everything I needed at least. And I think this will actually fit in here as well. Let's try it. Yeah, it does. They haven't changed it much. Oh, that click, wow. That's a great showcase, hold on. Wow. Come back, old Mac, we need laughing stock.
Nothing, not a noise. In fact, the only way to get this to work in my other MacBook Pro is to plug it in upside down. Otherwise, it just does not latch in at all. You know what, since we're rolling with USB-C, let's keep talking about USB-C devices. In fact, we're gonna talk about the microphone I'm recording this video with. This microphone uses USB-C, and here's the cable that came with it. It's a weird L-shaped, gold-plated looking cable. There's a joke to be made here. And take note, if you will, the size of this connector and generally just how it's shaped. Now take a look at the hole on the bottom of this microphone. Notice anything about it? It's recessed. Okay, so what's the big deal with that? Well, Take into consideration the cable I was using earlier. Look at this big boxy outside it has. This does not fit in here. It just doesn't, it won't fit. It's a square peg in a round hole. And the first question that comes to mind is why? Why would you do this? And I was thinking to myself, Maybe it's to, you know, protect the cable so that, you know, when you twist it or if it gets knocked over, it's like an extra stress reliever. And you know what? Let's carry on with this USB-C device fiasco because the next disappointment is you. And by you, I mean the camera this video is recorded on and the phone, but we'll get to that later. You're currently watching this on a Logitech Pro webcam, which was marketed as a 4K webcam. The current video you're watching is at 1080p. Why? Well, first off, because 60 FPS is only available in 1080p, but second off, because they removed the option for 4K entirely. Instead, you just get this big pop-up telling you upgrade to Windows 11, which no one's doing that. And you may notice, does this look like 1080p to you? This doesn't look like 1080p to me. 1080p would give this thing a run for its money. Look at how noisy the footage is. Look at how weird the exposure is. And in the settings, you can only get the choice to choose between one exposure or two frame rate. If you prioritize one, you can't have the other. I picked frame rate because exposure looks terrible. And even now, when my hand comes into frame, you'll notice the entire frame just gets dimmer and the frame rate looks like it changes and the noise level changes and ugh. This thing was not cheap and I despise every penny that I spent on it. In the future, I'll definitely look at getting an actual camera setup, especially considering I have GoPros. I have several GoPros. I have this and I have the Max. They put the camera you're looking at to shame and they're tinier and some of them are even cheaper. If you get a used GoPro, you can actually get really good quality video for decently cheap. This Hero 7 Black here hasn't had any of the overheating issues that I've heard that the newer ones have, and honestly, I like this thing a lot. It's not disappointing me. But yet a camera like this that you're looking at this video on is somehow the worst thing you've ever seen. It cannot be that hard to make a good webcam. Maybe it's for the idea that you're only going to be using it for Zoom calls or stuff like that where compression will kill your video anyways, but having this noise change every frame isn't really good for your data stream anyways. If anything, I think it'd make things worse. But okay, 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 USB-C devices, right. Let's keep talking about those, because I've got this Anchor Power Bank, this uh, PowerCore 3 Elite 26K 87 watt. And about three months into owning this thing, it kicked the bucket for no reason. It does nothing. When you plug it in, it does this little weird error code on the light dial here and then does nothing. And again, not cheap, huge battery. Batteries are expensive, and all the cells in this thing are probably just going to be wasted, when in reality, it's some stupid microcontroller or chip in here that went dead because they can't manufacture them for anything. Again, I should have read the reviews, because lo and behold, you look at these reviews for the Anchor Power Bank here, people have had the exact same issues, and if you want to actually get them apart to repair them, God forbid, they're all glued in, you need a spudger, you need heat, and I don't really want to go putting heat on my batteries. So even now, as much of a repair advocate as I am, I'm not touching this thing. It's just taking up space. You know what, since we're talking about batteries, we can't really look past the poor Note 10 Plus. This one here is probably the most depressing to me because I love this phone. This is my favorite phone of all time. I think it's the best phone that Samsung ever made. And it's dead. I don't know why. I was charging it up, I tapped the corner, and it died. I kid you not, I touched the corner, and it died. Yes, this thing is old. It's, well, it's not that old, really. I've seen phones that are older than this keep working just fine. And yeah, she's had a bit of wear and a, a bit of tear. And the worst part about it is it's not something I can fix. I've taken this thing apart so many times, just hoping and praying that it'll come back to life because I clean every connector. I reconnect the battery. I check the battery voltage. It's fine. Everything is fine. It just doesn't boot. By doesn't boot, I mean doesn't turn on. And if you look up videos of repairing these things, it's typically just some stupid little capacitor that goes dead for no reason. But I'm so in denial, I just keep plugging this thing back in, hoping and praying that one day it just spontaneously comes back on. Because after all, all I did was touch the corner. What, did I like shock it or something? Should I have been wearing an ESD band? This one really saddens me. Let's keep going strong with USB-C. Xbox Elite Controller. Yep, 
USB-C. And honestly, this thing right here, this is the second one of these I bought, and it's the second gen one. The price on this thing is ridiculous for what it is. It is not that customizable. You can take the sticks off, you can take the D-pad off, and that's about it. Sure, it's got little things under here so you can tune the sensitivity of each stick or whatever, but, and paddles, but, you know, that's kind of standard, and trigger locks, which, yeah, sure, okay. Thing is, this controller was fine, but it wasn't fine. Listen to this bumper. Can't hear anything? Neither can I. Let's try the other one. Oh wow, that's what a bumper sounds like. But if I run my finger up it... That's right, this bumper sticks. You have to push it up manually in order to get it to engage again. And this isn't the only controller I had this issue with. And in fact, the reason I bought the first Gen Elite controller is because the controller I had before that had this exact same issue. It's always the left bumper that does it for some reason. The other one's just fine. Oh yeah, another interesting detail about the sticks on this controller and the other Elite controller, they wiggle when you throw them. As in, they overshoot because of just how heavy they are. On this controller, it's not so bad, but look at this clip from the other one. It is insane. With how expensive this controller is, you would expect this to not affect it because, you know, it's literally almost the price of an Xbox One S. But no, same controller platform, same problem, of course. And don't think I'm some filthy console gaming peasant either. My old mouse was a Razer Viper Ultimate, and it came with this charging dock. The idea is simple. You drop it on these two pins, and it charges except it doesn't. In fact, the first day I got it, I had to clean these contacts with isopropanol just to get it to work the first time, and it worked once. Every single time I clean these contacts, they work one time, and that's it. Either because it picks up too much dust or whatever, it just, it, it isn't working. And well, this poor thing? This uses micro USB. Can't see it, but it's in there. And that's a brilliant segue because we're about to talk about micro B. Oh boy. Where would the world be if it wasn't for this connector? Probably in a much better place, really. But we'd be here for the rest of my life if we decided to talk about micro B, so let's just talk about some micro B devices. First off, this Switch controller. Yes, I own a Nintendo Switch. Yes, it is disappointing. I'm not even gonna bother covering it. This controller, I paid too much for, and it's made out of crap. The sticks do not feel very good. The buttons do not feel very good. But I thought it was workable, and that's all that really mattered to me. Until I realized, after buying it, uh-oh, Mark of the Beast. And again, I have USB cables that are micro B. It wouldn't be that big of a deal, but remember that issue I talked about with this microphone? The port is recessed. And honestly, it's the same thing with this, actually, now that I think about it. Try to fit any micro USB cable except for the one that came with it in these holes. You cannot do it. It does not fit. Square hole, round peg. This isn't that one video. It doesn't work. This is the exact same thing. Half my cables do not fit in this, and I don't even think this one came with a cable. Probably because they were so disappointed that the Switch controller, which, mind you, the Switch comes with USB-C, still uses micro B. So yeah, disappointment. And you know what? We're on a bit of a roll here with micro USB. So let's bring out this thing. This poor dusty thing, which is currently eating the contrast, is my Nectar Panorama P6. And honestly, this was my first MIDI keyboard I ever got. You wanna know what sold me? Haywire sold me. This video, Smooth Criminal, this cover goes hard. This little automatic fader here, this was the gimmick that sold me and I loved it. Well, yeah, guess what? doesn't work anymore. In fact, let me prove it. See, this is what we should strive for in USB cables. But yes, it has to come with disappointment because the fader itself takes a separate micro USB. Let's turn her on. Watch the fader. What the hell? That really loud click you just heard was from the keyboard. I don't want to know what just happened in there. Now here's the thing, I can do without an automated fader. That has nothing to do with what I actually do with the keyboard, which is play the keyboard. And yes, before you ask, I have tried with different power supplies. It is not the cable, it is not the power, it is the fader. Let's boot this puppy up in test mode, shall we? 
So in test mode, you can tell exactly what is happening with each individual key. So as you can see here, when I press this key, it tells me the aftertouch and the lights light up to show it and everything. It's kind of cool. But let's focus on this little key here, B2. The aftertouch works just fine. But occasionally, if you're trying to hold a note on this or play a chord on this, it will just cut out, leaving you with two keys or no keys, which I also have a foot pedal for this, which came with a cut cable out of the box. So that was pretty disappointing too. Other than that, this thing works fine. Everything on it is okay. But that one key being a little bit busted has really gotten on my nerves. I asked if I could get them to repair it and it didn't go well, but I don't remember the details. I wouldn't want to ship something this big in the mail anyways. Which in case you're curious, this is actually the big Panorama P6 with all the keys. This thing is massive. All the more to disappoint me with. Interestingly, another thing that almost disappointed me is my Astro 850s, and I'll talk about them because they're also micro B. These things are decently old, and I've actually had to replace the battery in them after they started swelling on my head, which was terrifying. The first thing I noticed was that these two buttons stopped working because of how fat the battery got, which notably the volume dial here also doesn't work without some nice compressed air spray in every five days or so. But more importantly, Yes, it uses micro B, and the base uses micro B too. The base for these things, which is just off screen, has one of the pegs that is meant to charge the headphones permanently pushed down. And I haven't mistreated it at all. I just put them on there and one day it never came back up. That's fine, because I can just use them cabled. But what isn't fine is the software. And not just the software, but how the software interacts with your PC and the base station. If you try to update the software on these for one reason or another, it does not work at all no matter how hard you try, and trust me, I know it. And what's funny is this isn't just limited to the Gen 3s of these. The Gen 4s have the exact same issue. People online have hypothesized and actually tested with some success. It's because that these and the base station for them only support USB 1.0. USB 1.0 came out in 1996, and USB 2.0 came out in 2000. So if you try to use a cable from 2000 or newer with these things, chances are it just won't work for no reason. I do like that Mercury switch though. All in all though, I like these headphones. I'm gonna keep using them. You know what headphones I don't like? The Sony WH-1000XM4s, which yes, it is a great name. You may notice I don't actually have these. I took them back because I had time to. I did not get suckered in and permanently stuck with the worst headphones I've ever tried. Thank the Lord. These things were shilled to hell and back by just about everybody ever. Everyone was like, oh my God, these, these sound great. Their noise canceling is incredible. Which yeah, it was pretty good, but they sound terrible. And you don't have to just take my word for it either. You can look at Critical's video on these things or his graph or his post or anything that he says about them. He agrees. And that man is the definition of objective most of the time. In fact, I'm sure some of you out there have tried them. My friends sure have. I let them try mine and I let them try the ones in the store, which sounded the same. And they just sound terrible. It's the bass completely drowns out just about anything else you could possibly hear through them. And I don't mean drowns out like it's really punchy and really overpowering like some Skull Candy Crushers. No, it's just all muddy. It sounds like you're listening to music through a styrofoam cup filled with cotton balls. They were not worth the hype at all. And honestly, after seeing that, I went directly for the AirPods Max. It was my main deciding factor. Which mind you, I had two other pairs of headphones before that. I had the noise canceling 700s by Bose and the QuietComfort 35 twos by Bose. The QuietComfort 35 twos were good. The 700s were, uh, touch controls are generally speaking garbage. Actually having physical buttons is probably the single most underrated thing this decade. And that's agonizing. Which yes, that exact facet was another reason why I bought the AirPods Max. I needed those physical buttons. But you know what, we've already talked about headphones. Let's skip straight to other things. What is this? Well, you're looking at the board for a Sagem Com router, the stock one that you usually get with Spectrum. How many ports is that? One, two, three, and then the one for the internet input. At the time when I got this, I needed four ports and I didn't have an ethernet switch. So this thing only having three basically completely killed my productivity for a minute. You may notice it's not in its shell. I got mad and destroyed it, don't worry about it. But around the same time, somebody decided to airdrop me a three pack of Cisco Velop routers. These things are supposed to make a mesh network around your house to improve connectivity throughout the entire building, which I found didn't help much at all. But let's check those ports. Two. One for internet input, one for internet output. So on top of my imaginary Velop router here, I also needed a Netgear switch. 
here it is. There's just another problem. Remember how I said it barely worked? Yeah, that's because I could not even get signal in the room behind the router with a thin wall between them. So that meant that the nodes that I had set up basically had to be within line of sight to actually function. That's ridiculous. Let's keep talking about the internet. What's this thing? Oh, well that's a Eufy home base that I ripped apart. We'll get to why in a bit. For a while, I was using a Eufy video doorbell on my front door, just because I wanted a video doorbell. And I liked the idea of having everything be stored locally by a device that I have control over. It seemed really cool to me. And honestly, I fell hand, foot, and finger for it, only to find almost immediately that this thing was uploading your entire video stream to the internet unencrypted to anyone that had the URL. No joke, and there are plenty of posts talking about it. The guy who made the YouTube video on this is an absolute saint for it. Not to mention the battery on this thing, even when I had it working, wasn't that good. You can do something to make it work, I'm sure, but ugh. And again, when I don't like products, I rip them apart. So I ripped this apart, I tried using the UART ports to get anything out of it, and it's locked down with like 13 different watchdogs and something. For what? For what? What are you protecting? It's unencrypted streams to the internet, and you knew that. So yeah, garbage, ripped apart, trash. Honestly, these two make me the maddest. But just because I value your time and don't want to give you so much disappointment that you overdosed, we're going to focus on one last thing. This right here is the P51, spelled P51. I'm not even joking. It's an Astell and Kern DAC and amp that I was hoping to use on my bare dynamic headphones just in case I didn't have something powerful enough to run 80 ohms. But when I plugged this in and I plugged my headphones into it, they didn't even get loud. I kid you not, the bare dynamics did not even get loud through this and they didn't sound any better either. So I tried it with some other headphones. I tried it with my AirPods. I tried it with a couple other just weak random headphones I had laying around from like big lots or something. And it doesn't get loud at all, and it doesn't sound good either, which I mean, naturally it doesn't. All my headphones suck. And mind you, this thing is actually made to run headphones more powerful than 80 ohms, definitely. And sadly, I just don't have any headphones I can use to see if it really does sound good. I could totally buy a pair, but I'm not really in the market at the moment, so... For now, this poor thing has also disappointed me. But it's the one that has the most potential. That's why it's last. And I know for a fact that there's more things that have disappointed me than just what I've showed you here. But honestly, at this point, it's starting to get a bit redundant. So for all intents and purposes, what you're looking at here isn't necessarily a list of things to avoid or things to look for or anything like that. It's just things that for me did not work out, despite me still having some faith for this poor thing. I could talk about the fact that my Thunderbird anniversary is a complete lemon. I could talk about the fact that my Mission Workshop rake backpack, which is $550, had a stitching flaw, which they quickly replaced. Thank you very much. Or if we're really talking about disappointments, we can really talk about the fact that this video is over for now because I don't want to talk about disappointments anymore. So thanks for coming to listen to my big old rant about a bunch of different crap that just did not work properly. This is not an original idea by any means, but you know, we all have to suffer sometimes. And you may notice I don't make videos very often. Honestly, I don't really know why, but it's just how I've kind of been lately. But if you want to see me, you know, try to get a shell on some of these old boards, do some reverse engineering stuff, hell, maybe just, you know, tear stuff apart, repair things. They're all side hobbies of mine. I could record them. So let me know if you'd like to see that. For now though, I'm gonna go with the rarest hobby that I almost never practice, and that's ending the video. I'll see you next time.